methods. Um, it's 551.47 and yes, uh, mine. It matches in mine. <laughs> okay. Um, there's wiring systems. Um, can you define a, what, what they're saying by wiring system, conduits, um, and tubing? You know, those are two things that we don't, um, I mean, I know what wire is, but what's a wiring system and a conduit and tubing? Well, a, a wiring system would be a type of cable that is suitable for the installation of where you're installing it. And what I mean by that, if you've ever gone to an electrical supply store or a Home Depot and get an electrical section of it, you'll see different types of cabling there, wiring systems. There's one that's a non-metallic sheath, which we call Romex, and it has an outer cover. It's UL listed, and it has the size wire that you would use, and it's rated for that. And it would be one method of using it to all you got to do is put staples in it and to hold it in place and put it in an area where it's not subject to physical damage. And then you'll look around and you'll see another shelf. I have something like a, a metal tubing and there's conductors inside of that. That's called MC, a metal clad conductor. It's a wiring system. It is more durable and can be in areas that do not have, uh, not, it's not subject to physical damage where it could be run on the surface. So it's a choice of what you use. But, and then there's other wiring systems too that is a tube and it's flexible and you have to push the conductors in there. So you can decide of how many conductors you need for that. And the cold addresses how many you can put in that according to the size. So not to confuse the matter, there's different type of wiring methods, but normally people would use something that is uh, easy for these tiny homes because everything is pretty tight and you're trying to get it in there and be safe about doing that. So they'll use something as a wiring system as a non-metallic sheeting, which we normally call Romex. That's a wiring system. It has conductors in it. It has a covering on it to protect the conductors from being damaged but it has to physically be away from uh, being on the surface because it's subject to damage being smashed or nailed or screwed into. Okay, and what is conduit or uh, metal tubing? Metal tubing uh, is actually a piece of pipe. It's thin in some cases, they call it electrical metallic tubing. And sometimes it's rigid, it's like galvanized. It's a thicker metal base. It's harder to cut, it's harder to bend, it's harder to install but it's really suitable for rugged areas and it's called rigid metal conduit RMC. And that is explained that you can use that, but you really don't have to. It's sort of like putting a Cadillac part in a Vol uh, Cadillac part in a Volkswagen. It's not necessary that you do that, but there's applications for everything. So in tiny homes, you'll want to pick something that you can use that is minimally required and easy to use and less cost effective. And that's usually non-metallic sheathing. But they're saying you can use other wine systems. You can use pipes, you can use tubing, you can use all these different types, but this is what we want you to use. And you'll see that they have an article beside that. So you turn to that article. Now the articles are by the article 320, that three being chapter three, you would go in chapter three, go up the numbers because they're a numerical sequence and then find that dot that it's looking for. And you'll be able to see the definition of it because it has definitions first. And then it'll tell you the type of conductor that it is. And it has uses permitted and uses not permitted. So, Okay. Can you put conduit on the outside of a wall? Yes. You can it run is protected from physical outside. damage. It protects the conductors in there. But would you want to do that in a tiny home? Would I want to do it on a concrete wall, like in a garage or a block? Yes, because I can't get down the wall because it's concrete or block. It's inaccessible. So I need to put a conductor there so I can get a receptacle so I can use the device. So therefore I'd use metal. But if I'm in a tiny home and the walls are open and the studs are exposed, I would want to use something that's very flexible. It's allowing you to use these different types. You make that decision on what you want to use. Can you use Romex on the outside of a wall? 
no. Uh, you cannot use Romex on the outside of walls unless it's protected from physical damage. When you start to enclose it in a conduit, then you start to get into issues with overheating because they go by how many conductors can be in a raceway without derating the cable. And here's what I mean by that. If it's number 12 conductor in article 310-15, there is a table and it says, okay, if you use number 12 wire, it is good for a certain amount of amperage. If you enclose it in a conduit, well then current relates directly to heat dissipated on the conductor. And what's going to happen there is you're enclosing this Romex in a conduit. So not only does it has the outer covering, like a coat, now you're putting it in a pipe, like a quilt, and it's, you would get hot yourself if it was you're laying in bed on something like that. Well, then it gets hot, so it's overheating, so they derate the conductor. So no longer is it good for a 12 conductor, good for 20 amps. It's only good for 15 amps. So it kind of defeats the purpose of the load that you're doing. So not to confuse you or get in detail, it makes sense to use Romex on the inside where it's protected from physical damage and use conduit on the outside and install the individual conductors and conduit outside for whatever purpose that you may need it for, because there may be a reason for you doing that. So for instance, let's just say, um, I'm building my tiny house with SIPS panels, structural insulated panels, yes. where you have OSB on two sides and then you have your insulation in the middle. You could run conduit um, yes, on the can. outside of that and it would be legal. Might not yes. be pretty, but it would be legal. It would be legal. Now, when you get into running the conduit, it's, it's suitable for outdoor locations, but you also have to use connectors and couplings. Connectors is where it terminates at a box or wherever it's going to terminate into. And couplings is when you're joining two 10 foot lengths together. They have to be rated for weather type insulation. So if you do not use that, well then they, you'll violate the code or make you take the conduit out and put it back in. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can use conduit outside, but it has to have fittings rated for the insulation. And if it's on the inside, you can use indoor type fittings, which are a lot cheaper and easier to you. Okay. All right. And uh, before we move on, um, can you tell us what UF cable is? UF cable is underground feeder. It is used for direct burial in the earth, the direct earth. And the code requires it on, it, uh, I believe it's uh, chapter four at the very beginning on burial deaths and how far down it has to be in the ground. So a shovel or a pick or something like that, someone planting something doesn't damage the cable. So they try to get you put it down so deep to be able to do that. UF is also good for being around areas where it's a wet location. So, so would there be any use for a UF cable in a tiny house? You can use it, uh, but the Romex has an outer sheathing on it and on the inside, it has the insulated conductor. So when you split that outer sheathing, the conductors are easily exposed and you can separate them. But if you use a underground feeder, remember it's rated for direct burial and ground gets wet. So they want to make sure it does it. It has watertight integrity. So a UF cable will have insulation. It's like you pull, poured a mold over the conductors. They act, actually have to be stripped back and the conductor pulled away from that molding so you can terminate wherever you're going to begin or end that uh, wire uh, installation. But it so is still. Um, you can use it. It's a lot harder to use. It's more expensive to use, but it's very good cable. Right. But you wouldn't want to use it um, in a place that could be damaged. It has to. Be, yes. in a wall Same way with Romex, it has to not be subject to physical damage. And when it comes up out of the ground, if we're going to install it in the earth, it has to be protected by a conduit. Then we have to meet the conduit size for the D rating so you don't violate that. But it has to be protected from weed eaters and someone hitting against the wall or it being damaged in any which way. So you have to use a, a conduit that is rated for that use so that can be sleeved up the wall 
before it goes into the building or before it goes into a metal box or the panel. All right, and what's your feeling on metal boxes or um, non-metallic boxes or plastic? Well, non-metallic boxes are less expensive. They make them uh, just in, they make all type of qualities. They make the real thin ones that meet UL standards and meets the National Electrical Code. But if you hit it with the side of a hammer, you may break it or it'll bust apart. And then they make them thicker. So the, the thicker metal box or non-metallic boxes are ideal for park models because one thing you're concerned about weight, aren't you? You're hauling it down the road. So you want to reduce the amount of weight every which way you can. And that's one way of doing it. It does have threaded holes in it so you can put your devices on and it is nails or it can be have a front mounting type. There's different uh, installation types that you have for that. A metal box does the same thing. It's just made of metal. It's more sturdy and it's definitely good for when you're going to hang a fan because fan rated boxes will either be metal and some of them plastic, but the metal ones are a better way of supporting a heavy fan. Normally in tiny homes, it's going to be a lightweight fan. It's going to be small in diameter. So you could probably find a non-metallic box that is fan rated for 35 pounds to where you could safely do an install and not endanger members plastic or nylon and strip the threads with the weight of the load, the fan. So non-metallic boxes is probably the wiser, most economical choice to use in a park model. Okay. Uh, what's a, what's what a, a pancake, pancake box is a boxes. real, yeah, a pancake box is just like, just think of a pancake in a, in a frying pan. It's not really thick and it's kind of wide. Well, this round box is rated for fans and it's also rated for usually a single conductor only in other words you can't run one conductor in make connections and go to the next box because every box is rated by square inches and you can only get so many conductors in a square inch box so bottom line pancake box is great for when you it's only as thick as half inch Normally drywall is half inch. So now you don't have to mount the box recessed. You can mount it directly on top of the ceiling joist or the wall stud. And when you put your drywall on, now it is flush with the drywall. You can mount your device and it doesn't stick away from the wall. It's a good installation. It's just a very small box and you only want to put one single conductor. And the single conductor I'm talking about at black white in the bare wire or a black red white in the bare wire depends on if you're going to use it for fan you may want one conductor to control the fan motor and one conductor to control control the light okay that's what a pan box is really thin four inch circle and it mounts right on the top of a stud so when the drywall is installed it's flush yeah, or the or a lot of tiny houses are using the shiplap or some kind of um, uh, wood siding, uh, wood interior finish that yes. could be um, three eighths of an inch or half inch or three quarters of an inch. Yeah, remember if you cut it to be flush with the stud. In other words, you're going to mount it on a stud and you cut that stud to where your box can fit a half inch recessed into that. You could lose the integrity of the structure of the studs, so that may not be a wise thing to do. But in some cases, it, that is not the factor. So that would work too, it's where you could use that thin paneling, and it would be flush. Okay. All right. So you want the uh, box to be flush with the outside of the interior finish. Is that, that what is we're correct. saying? Yes. All right. Most um, devices that you hang, fans, fixtures, switches, plugs they all are rated to be on devices that are flush with the wall. And all they're right. not rated, they're designed to be that way. So when you put them on, they're, they're smooth and flush with the wall. Makes sense. All right, and let's go on to cable supports. It says here, we're connected to cable connectors or clamps. Cables shall be secured and supported within, and the number is 12 inches of outlet mm -hmm. boxes, panel boards, and splice boxes. On appliances and supports shall be secured 
uh, supports and securing shall be provided at intervals of four and a half feet at other places. Yes. So what do they say in there? Yeah, uh, the non-metallic cabling, the Romex, which you're talking about, is uh, it, it has to be supported before it gets to the box. So the box is not a means of clamping down the cable and keep it in place. Because when you put it into the box, you're going to split the outer sheath and you're going to expose the conductor so you can make connections. If the box does not have a cable holder on it, well, then you need to make sure that your staple is within 12 inches of that box in this particular case. And that's usually a staple or some kind of secure UL listed uh, uh, fastening device to hold that cable in place so it doesn't move forward or backward. I can't just take a nail and bend it over. No, it's not approved for that installation because people, they can't, they don't know how uh, well people can do things. <laughs> so they're trying to make everything as uh, safe as possible, might I say. And so they rate staples for that type of conductor and they want you to use that. The inspector is going to look for that. But if you use the nail, well, then he has the authority having jurisdiction. He can say yes or no. Now you're dependent on that. It took you time to install that. And he comes there and says, uh-uh, that isn't going to do. It's not UL listed. It's not the proper fastening method. You're going to have to replace it. Now you're redoing work that you already did. So why not buy what you need correctly at the very beginning? With that being said, they sell staples in boxes of 50 to 100 or even higher than that. And you can, they're, they're cheap. They're not very expensive. So just buy the right fastener for the cabling so you don't run into future issues. What's happened to, well, I've troubleshot uh, some installations before where they put the, the fastener too tight. It never showed up for years. And then they had lightning hit the house and that mass amount of energy in a short period of time penetrated outside the installation, penetrated the staple, burned it in half and even caused part of a fire issue. So that's why they're saying use the proper stables for the installation so you don't have not only problems right after the installation, but problems in the future. So you said don't put the staple in too tight. Is that what you're saying? Do not put the staple in too tight, just snug. Just snug. When you tie your shoes to your foot, do you want it really tight or do you want it just snug? Okay. It's common sense to where you do the same with cables. You do not want them to move forward or backward but you don't want to pinch it to where it could possibly penetrate into the insulation and into the conductor. Exactly. Okay. Especially since the staple is metal. And if you yes. conduct, conduct the hot lead to the ground, it's going to cause a short. It's going to cause a short and then you're going to have to redo, replace the whole cable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I had another thought here. Well, let's move on and, and maybe it'll come back to me. Um, okay. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, four and a half feet. What did it mean by four and a half feet? Four and a half feet is as far as you can stretch that cable before it starts to sag. So they want to make sure that you staple that on every four and a half feet, like going across an attic or going up and down the verticals of the wall studs. But when you drill holes horizontally, and it goes across the studs and it's an inch and a half back into a three and a half inch stud. Well, then they don't require that you staple it only when it exits that and goes vertical or goes horizontal to where it's a, there's no stud, no hole through the stud. Okay. So it's keeping it in place. That's really all they're doing is keeping it from sagging and doing the 12 inch before the box to keep it fastened to where it doesn't move forward or backwards. So you lose that connection integrity that you have in the box. Uh, where would you use kick plates? Pick plates is where you would use as I, I just mentioned that you need to be an inch and a half back into the stud, which is covered in article uh, chapters one through four. And that little plate, there's some cases where you just cannot do that because it's furring strips or it's really thin or there's something else there to restrict you from doing that. So they say if you're less than an inch and a half, where that hole is drilled so that cable can pass through you need to use a metal pick plate 
And that little plate is something to protect uh, drywall people or anybody installing a wall covering is not to use one of their screws and penetrate that conductor and do the same thing that you're trying not to do when you're stapling the wire to the, to the stud. So the pick plate, they wouldn't be able to penetrate that unless they used a metal drill or they used a metal self-tapping screw and they already know if they hit that, that's not where they should be. Yeah, they use exactly. the same requirement for plumbing and for air conditioning too to protect those lines. I, I saw something in here that I didn't realize at first, but it makes sense that if you're using metal cover plates that they need to be grounded. Yes. Uh, the code started covering that because of uh, people getting chopped. They never do cover things like that because normally the receptacle has what they call a metal yoke device on it. That is what the green conductor is connected to. And that is also the metal framing that holds the device in place so you can use it. And it screws against the wall. So the green conductor is connected to that. And that bonds that whole metal yoke. Now you got the metal plate with a metal screw and it screws into that device. It's grounded because that's metal on metal. But then they got people started to use plastic screws and it didn't exactly meet the device face plate. So it wasn't touching metal to metal. So if the hot conductor on the inside wasn't fastened well or it broke free and it stuck onto that metal face plate and it had a plastic screw in that yoke, it's energized. So all you got to do is ground yourself somewhere and touch that metal plate and now you have electrocution. So the code says, okay, now we're going to cover that. So they started saying anything that's metal that's not securely fastened to the yoke needs to be bonded. So they could require that you do that or not do that. Jurisdiction have an authority can say, okay, you used a metal screw, you used a metal plate, therefore it is integrally grounded. So you're okay. But if they say, no, this doesn't, really meet the standards that you need to protect everybody from being electrocuted. So you got to bond that metal plate. Now the cost of the plate's gone up because the manufacturer has to have a UL listed way of terminating a green wire or providing a pigtail on the plate to go back and be connected with all the grounding conductors or the green or bare conductors. So make a long story short, use plastic plates. <laughs> <laughs> okay.